You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Do you know where your various commodities and your futures and your options are? Let's find out together. It's time for TWIFO. This week in Futures Options, I will be your host, your guide, your mater D for the next hour here exploring the world of all things futures, options. Mark Longo, of course, from theoptionsider.com, as well as from this fun and indeed fine network. If you're liking what you're hearing, not just for this program. But, of course, for the full network, make sure you leave those reviews on your platform of choice so folks can continue to enjoy this content and discover it in these crazy troubled times. We all could use a little bit more sane content in our ear holes these days. Glad to see so many of you have discovered the network over the last few months. We like to keep that influx coming, keep that listener count growing for all of our programs out there. So keep those reviews coming. Of course, keep those questions coming, too. We do love to hear from you guys. And let's see who we've got joining me on the old TWIFO program today. First, holding down his usual spot on the FTSE Russell hot seat, he is Mr. Sean Smith, the Managing Director of Derivatives Licensing over there at FTSE Russell. Mr. Smith, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. Hey, Mark. Great to be here. Um, I'm hoping I have a good connection. Can you hear me okay? So far, so good. Fingers crossed, sir. Are you not in your undisclosed location this week, sir? Are you, are you on the go? I am not. I am on the go uh, with some family stuff, but I am uh, really looking forward to the show today. All right. Should be fun. And also joining us, holding down the CME Group hot seat. It's been a little while since he's been back on this program, but we're happy to have him back. He is, of course, the once and future Dr. Vicks, author of a few tomes about VIX trading, including an upcoming one you should have in your hot little hands very soon, listeners. And he also moonlights over there at Loyola and indeed EQ Derivatives, educating folks about them, their derivatives. Mr. Russell Rhodes, Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the program, sir. 
as always, just very, very happy and honored to be here and and always loving the love sharing the line with my buddy Sean Smith. <laughs> All right. I usually ask this for Sean, but since you're our CME hot seat this week, by the way, listeners, before we even get into that, you guys can run the movers and shakers for yourselves and all the other reports we're going to discuss throughout the entirety of the show completely for free. You know where to go. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O, or slash TWIO. This week in options. Both of those should work. That should get you to the spot where you can run all these reports for yourselves. So if you're listening to this, let's say, next Monday, and you're out of sync with what we're talking about here, you can just move the report date back to today or to whatever day you want out there and check out all the reports for yourself over there. All right, Mr. Rhodes, this is the part of the show where I usually ask someone, I'll have you, I'll anoint you this time, to choose where we begin we would break down the movers and shakers for the week. Should we look to the light side, a.k.a. the upside movers, or go dark side, sir, and look at the red? Where should we begin our journey this week, sir? I'm, I'm feeling natty, so I want to go to the upside. Oh, feeling natty, are you? Well, there's a lot of upside on the screen, listeners. If you run this report for yourselves, you'll see that it is roughly two-thirds, maybe three-quarters or so green on this report for the week. So a lot of upside on the screen. Uh, probably roughly about ten or so names to the dark side. That's about it, so... So dark side, not a lot. So probably good that we start in uh, the light side. Usually we go top five. I'm going to expand it actually over here to include number seven because we've had a lot of you asking, where does crypto, where does Bitcoin fall in this movers and shakers report? So if we add Bitcoin to the list, it doesn't make the top five this week, listeners. So that should maybe dishearten you a little bit, but it's still moving. It just shows what an active upside week it is because Bitcoin was number seven and it still moved nearly 6%, 5.76%. But that's only good enough for a number seven. Number five on our list, listeners, of our actual top five is lumber. Up 8.65%. It was number one to the upside last week. It's been a big mover of late. Unfortunately, like we said last week, not a huge option story there. Only about 100 odd contracts trading during the week. So, not going to have a chance to really parse lumber too much this week on the show. Platinum number four, up nearly 10%, 9.85%. It was number one. In the other direction, to the dark side last week, off 7.1%. So a big swing in platinum. Unfortunately, same deal there. 54 contracts on the tape so far this week. So not a heck of a lot. to Not even 100 to parse out there. Number three, iron ore. You know the deal out there. That one's been moving a lot of late. Up 10.32% this week for number three. Number two, the werewolves are afraid yet again because silver back in the top five. Up 20 20- 20.64%. We had an interesting discussion on our option block program last episode, listeners. I encourage you to check it out about the comparative volatility of silver and Bitcoin. They were about almost equal, about 66% coming into showtime. So interesting thought process there. Which would you rather own the ball on, Bitcoin or silver right now? Which one perhaps merits it more? <laughs> Some folks on the crypto side were a little bit puzzled that an, an asset that can go from sub penny all the way to 20,000 and down again to 10,000 uh, could have the same vol as silver, which hasn't done that. And yet, that's exactly what we're seeing out there. Number one to the upside, Nat Gas, up 21.32%. That one's popping off this week, listeners. May have to, may have to visit there this week. So far, 456,000 contracts on the tape in Nat Gas. Before we go there, let's swing to the dark side. Uh, number five to the dark side, oats off 1.93%. A lot of ags on the dark side this week. Number four, soybean meal off 3.02%. Number three, wheat off 5.15%. Number two, KC wheat off 5.4%. And number one to the dark side, our old friend, class three milk off 20.21%. Also doing some decent paper, almost 10,000 contracts on the tape. So this might be a first time in a while, perhaps ever, we've seen the entirety of one direction on our movers and shakers report, the light side, the dark side, completely consumed by ags. And I mean, dairy falls under that ag banner as well there, listeners. So yeah, all five of them on the ags front. Interesting stuff. All right, Mr. Rhodes, the table is set. Our journey can commence. Where should our first stop be on this movable feast, sir? Oh, I think I, I, I'm still feeling natty. We're going to start with energy. All right, let's start with energy then. Is this a product yeah. category that comes under your radar quite a bit? I know you've been Looking at energy a lot more of late, Mr. Rhodes, because it is a much more volatile, as you said before on the show, much more volatility-oriented asset class than people may assume. Is Nat Gas one that comes on your radar at all? It does. It, it I, You know, it's nicknamed the Widowmaker. So, uh, you know, anything that's called that, 
uh, often gets my attention. Uh, and, and I tend to, after we've had big moves like this, I try to find ways to either play the reversal or maybe play if we, uh, if we just flatten out after we've gotten that big you know, jerk move like we got last week up 20 plus percent. Yeah, you're talking about it. Big moves in that gas. Like you mentioned, it's our number one upsider on the week, 21.32%. That's, again, from last episode, last show, so from last Thursday. Our This Weekend Reports listeners, of course, the ones you can access, start from Monday. So from Monday's perspective, it's still up (laughs) 20.12%. So big week, no matter how you parse it out here in that gas, including a 17% jump. In one day, this is kind of reminiscent of some of the earlier breakouts we've seen of Nat Gas in the past where it had some big moves. Some people are joking this may be, may be back to the old Wild West days of Nat Gas. All that said, it's still a fairly cheap asset. 2.161 is where that front future is out there. But still, uh, it hit nine-month highs recently, about two and a quarter, 226 on that front month future on Wednesday. So those levels, even though it's still fairly cheap compared to some of the other assets, we're going to talk about it. maybe enough to start getting some utilities to start thinking about pulling the old switch. They like to go back and forth from coal to nat gas, depending on which one is cheaper. And right now, if nat gas continues on the upswing, it looks like it's petered out a little bit here. But if it continues on the upswing, could see some utilities pulling that switch over to coal. And that could maybe dampen some of the enthusiasm for nat gas here. Right now, the most active contract is the one that's that contract that's going away. And well, we got about 20 days to go on this one. So we still got still got a wee bit of time out here on that SEP contract. It did this week 37.6% of the paper. So far and away, number one. Let's see here. The vol, as you might expect, up a wee bit here. It's interesting. In that front contract, which has 20 days to go, the vol's up pretty strong. You go immediately beyond it, and you go out to the OC contract, which has 50 days to go, and that vol is off about half a point, whereas the front month vol up about five and a half points. So it does show a little bit of, shall we say, backwardation at the front portion of that curve. Listeners, The front portion getting frothy, getting turbulent. The rest of the curve, not so much. Then it bucks again. You get out to Jan and uh, out to February out there, and all of a sudden you've got a little bit more vol coming in out there to the tune of, oh, about a point or so. So, yeah, it's interesting stuff out here in, uh, in well, actually, that's the skew. The vol is still in on, uh, on Jan and Feb. The skew is up. Interesting stuff afoot out here. Let's go back to September uh, because uh, the vol is up and let's look at the skew the puts last week 2.7 percent rich this week 7.6 percent rich so puts leading the dance calls 1.6 percent cheap last week this week 6.2 percent cheap calls have come in markedly the puts are bit up maybe i mean usually if you shoot up the skew curve you might see something like that happen but usually if you shoot up as dramatically as we did here you expect the calls to maintain a little bit more of their value than they clearly have. Maybe the fact that we've kind of topped out a little bit here has caused people to come for it. Maybe some folks are just fading this pretty hard. Mr. Rhodes, this looks kind of reminiscent of what we see for skew moves out in WTI after it moves pretty high up, and then folks instantly faded. Are you getting the same kind of feels here, sir, for Nat Gas in the skew department? Yeah, that's that's kind of how it's looking. That's one of the reasons I wanted to you know bring it up was maybe we've uh... – I know it moves quickly and violently, but then it'll sit around and, and lull you into a little bit of complacency. And you mentioned that that sort of at the money backwardation that you were seeing, uh, that that's an indication that farther out, people are expecting things to calm down just a little bit. So, you know, might be something worth taking a, a, a look at a neutral trade on. Yeah, you know, the starkness of the rally, I wasn't expecting them to come and fade it as perhaps as immediately as they are. But I guess given what we've seen in WTI for the better part of the last year and change, I guess I shouldn't be too surprised that they would take the opportunity to fade any rally. But still, big stuff. Let's see what the big prints were out here. No surprise. Actually, this is a little bit of a surprise. I thought it would be more like the the two-handle strike. But actually, it's the two-half strike in the front month. The SEP contract did... Actually, it was a tie. Two half strike across the board in October and uh, September out here. Both did about 22,000 and change for these two half calls. So that was the strike du jour, not the two, which we kind of blew through really quickly. (laughs) But I guess some folks, when we were topping out there around two and a quarter on Wednesday, thought two half was the next stopping point because the two half calls here in uh, September traded a ton on Tuesday, 12,500 almost. The rest only about 3000 a day, but a good chunk of that opening. Let's see if the same deal was going on out there in October, if it was the same day and the same types of prints. Yeah, pretty much 
Tuesday, they did 11,600. Only a good chunk of that was closing in October, and then 4,000 on Wednesday, 1,800 today. So interesting. Opening paper in the nearer-term month, closing paper in the longer-term month. Strange, strange activity afoot out here. But again, that doesn't surprise me when we see such a weird movement in the underline. If you want some more optimistic, more bullish strikes, well, we got some for you here. D's three-quarter calls went up 3,300 times this week. You got to Jan, the six calls, six even. Man, that would certainly cause some utilities to pull the trigger to coal if we gapped up to six. But the Jan six calls traded 6,000 times here. And out to February, the six calls traded 6,000 times again. Maybe some weird time spreads are going up there. And the 6,000 calls also traded almost 3,000 times in March. So <laughs> that's maybe why we got some of those weird vol and skew numbers in those months out there as well. Because the six strike, that's, um, that's an interesting bridge. Perhaps too far? That would certainly be a heck of a move between now and the beginning of the year to get all the way up to six. But then again, given how much we moved this week, perhaps not so much. So, Mr. Rhodes, we got a weird, weird tail of the tape here where near term they're maybe fading it and maybe longer term it seems like maybe they're loading up. Is that your takeaway as well, sir? Yeah, and that's uh, for most markets. You got to assume that everybody's looking about, you know, I've, I think I heard 100 days to the election the other day. Now maybe it's 90 days or so. Uh, but you got to and I guess it depends on what what market it is, but, um, you know, how they might be affected by a regime change in the United States, to use a volatility term. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're we're going to see. We're going to see some volatility curve shapes that that if it weren't for an election, if you woke up and, and you were in a, a coma and you woke up and you're like, what in the world's going on? Uh, you know, that, that, that would be very perplexing if we didn't realize there's a really big event that's that's starting to bear down upon us. Yeah, we we're just talking about that on the option block program. That's been, a, you know, obviously a discussion point for since the beginning of the year, that blip. In the volatility futures going out to around that election cycle, it's been there for some time. It has persisted and indeed grown as, as the election has approached. Now some interesting data coming out of some quote-unquote war games that were held to try to see what would happen in the aftermath of the election. They war gamed a variety of scenarios. Uh, Trump winning, Biden winning, uh, Trump winning the Electoral College, but Biden winning the popular vote. And all of their scenarios, and one other one thrown in there too. Uh, and all their scenarios resulted in significant unease, significant volatility, perhaps civil unrest, and uncertainty as to who the victor could be, not just in the immediate aftermath of the election. Some of these scenarios went all the way out to Inauguration Day on January 6th. So that's, if you listen to that, and again, I don't think that was a completely impartial, unbiased group. I think they had a little bit of an axe to grind. But still, uh, if you look at some of their quote-unquote data, maybe that that vol spike around the election is, is underdone <laughs> for some of that. And certainly the duration of it, if, if it lasts all the way into the beginning of the year. Since we're talking vol and all things going on out there, let's go to equities now. So let's turn our attention to Mr. Sean. Hopefully he's pulled over to the side of the road. He's not driving right now. Mr. Sean, obviously a lot's been popping off out there in the world of equities and all things volatility. What has been on your radar? What's been lighting up your tape since the last time we chatted, sir? Well, you know, it's uh, I, I am not driving. I, I don't I don't drive and talk on the phone. So uh, I am definitely uh, uh, one that follows the letter of the law here. So uh, I am I am safe. Uh, and hopefully you can hear me clearly. Yeah, you sound great. Go for it, sir. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, first of all, Russell, it's great to hear your voice as well. It's always a pleasure uh, to be on uh, on the show with you. So um, welcome and uh, great, great, to, great to have you join. So with that, why don't we kind of talk about some some Russell um, in the in the theme of uh, Mr. Russell Rhodes joining us today. <laughs> Russell wants us to talk about Russell with Russell. I think we can do that. That's a lot of Russells. I, and- I want I want more Russell swag. I want some I want I want some Russell swag. We'll we'll talk after the show. <laughs> all right, so we'll get into all that. Let's parse it then. Let's do it. Let's see what was lighting it up out there in all things small cap. Of course, uh, not in our movers and shakers for the week, a rare moment, listeners. That just shows how strong the upside was, how strong the light side of the force was this week because it was up 4.5% as of Monday, and that even wasn't enough to, to break into the top 10. I already mentioned Bitcoin was up nearly 6%. That wasn't enough to do it. So it's a strong upside week. The force was with the upside this week, listeners, so not a lot uh, not a lot that Russell 2000, a rear week where nearly 5% 
not enough to light them up. 154410 is where the small caps are coming into the show here today. Let's see where the action was out here on the CME Russell E Mini options out here this week. Looks like the lion's share of the action was out there in the SEP contract, doing about 25% of the paper. The big print actually, you know, usually we talk about far out of the money downside puts in in the Russell. But this week it's actually upside call, 1675s. So roughly 130 handles out of the money calls going up in September. That led the dance out here this week. Let's go out to SEP and see what the vol coming in. The vol is still pretty frothy, though, even out to September at about a 27 and change. That puts it off nearly four handles. Uh, so about 3.9 or so on the week. So vol coming off after this protracted rally. We've seen that out there in the broad. In fact, let's set the, let's set the vol table now while we're talking about it. Coming into showtime here. We saw our old friend, the Bix Cash, a little bit shy of the 23 handle, about 22.70 or so. That puts it down not quite three points from last week, about 2.8 points. Uh, our old friend, the RVX, uh, I must mention, a lot, of the, a lot of the implied balls are hovering around a 27 or so, but the RVX still at about a 30, staying stubbornly at a 30. That puts it down, down from last show, but not quite as much as the Bix, down about one and three quarters points. In fact, that's exactly the same point drop as we had the week before. So it's been down... One and three quarters points both weeks in a row, which is kind of interesting. Our old friend, the VVIX, which is the vol of vol, at about a 106. That's down eight. So vol pretty much across the board is down. Not exactly surprising when the equities have been feeling the love, feeling the bull over the course of the past week. That spread, though, has widened out a little bit. That VIX, RVX spread at about 7.3 points. That puts it exactly about 1.3 points wider than what it was last week. Mr. Sean, a lot's been popping off in your neck of the woods. What's been lighting up your tape in the small cap land since the last time we talked, sir. So, yeah, there's there's lots of FTSE Russell information coming out. And, you know, there's – on our website, there's a, a, a really nice piece done by our, by our Philip Lawler in regards to the ripple effects of the, the U.S. dollar, how it's gotten slightly weaker and how it's uh, created a performance between our, our large cap index, the Russell 1000 and the Russell 2000. And, you know, this, this uncertainty of recovery um, – has given large caps a, a, a strength where there's um, less domestic um, exposure uh, with our large caps. So they've, out, they've outperformed the small caps where you see our small cap being much more uh, exposed on the domestic side. So large caps, the Russell 1000 has outproduced the uh, out, uh, outperformed the, the, the small caps in, in, in these in this, in, in this last week. Uh, but uh, with that news, there's been uh, some, some July numbers coming out of CME Group, which have been just absolutely fantastic in the, in, in the equity space. They averaged over 13 – the exchange averaged over 13.6 million contracts a day. Open interest is, is strong at 101 million contracts. But equities, the average daily volume was over 5.2 million uh, contracts a day. Uh, and equity, the whole equity complex grew by 82% in July. Russell 2000 minis grew by 61%. That's incredible volume for the month of July for uh, the, the Russell 2000 contract. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's showing that there's volatile times. Equities are leading the charge in terms of the asset class at CME Group uh, for the month of July. And uh, just really interesting times to see the the – uh, small caps versus large cap trade, that being the Russell 1000 uh, versus the Russell 2000. And there's a couple of, of links that I'll send you, Mark, after the show so you can tweet them out in regards to the, the performance of our indexes because of this uh, ripple effect of the U.S. dollar. We also have a, uh, uh, a, a nice survey that our asset owner uh, group takes in terms of uh, the global rise of uh, using smart beta in indices for investment strategies. It's a really nice piece, and I'll, I'll make sure that I send you the link for that as well for, your, uh, for, the, for, our, for our listening base. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting. You mentioned those numbers. We talked about uh, the FIA numbers for the entirety of the globe for the first half of the year. Back when I think Dan uh, Grams was on, with the, on the show with us a few weeks back. And it's interesting. A lot of people might be confused that equities get so much play on the show here on TWIFO, but it's the numbers reflected, not just in CME, where it's the lion's share of the paper they're putting up, but globally, I think it was somewhere around two-thirds of the overall volume and like three-quarters of the growth came on the equity complex globally, not just here, but you know, in India and other places 
equities are where the futures options action just is. That's where the intention is. That's where a lot of you are playing. We talk a lot of commodities and everything else out there, but equities are the lion's share of the action out there. Mr. Rhodes, I know you like to hang your hat on a little bit of equity volatility as well. What are your thoughts on this large cap versus small cap disassociation? Maybe what we're seeing here from a large cap versus small cap vol, anything going on there? Then I heard a little birdie told me before the show that maybe, just maybe, you've been uh, you've been playing around with some of those micro futures. Sir. So a lot to unpack there. Have at it. Trade. I've been trading the micros against each other, doing two two of the Russells versus one of the uh, – the S and P ones because there's about that dollar to dollar relationship. Uh, it's I, I put on a trade about a week ago, and the Russell is doing some catch up as far as that cap goes. And honestly, and I'm not just saying this because I'm in the CME hot seat, but honestly, I can't think of a better way. Uh, to try and play the spread between the two because those contracts are small enough that if you uh, if you suddenly want to tilt a little bit short, you know, if I if I decided that the stock market's overbought a little bit here and I want to tilt short, uh, maybe I, I um, sell one of my Russell uh, micros or I uh, short another of the S&P, you know, and get a little bit balanced short. But uh, the the performance difference between those two indexes, so there's only one other time that I know of that it's been that wide and it was in the other direction when we had the big small cap outperformance relative to large cap uh, after the election of Donald Trump. Uh, if, if he starts to look good in the polls, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if we see uh, a more rapid catch up with small caps versus large caps. But that that gap is going to narrow. And I think a good way to go about playing it is the way that I just said, uh, using those micros. Micros certainly have been uh, trading up a storm. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I, I, when Tim McCourt came on the show back down in Boca with us, Sean, oh, well over a year ago now to announce those, I, I, I didn't really pay much attention. I thought, okay, that's interesting. A, there's no options on them. And B, I'm sure they'll get some traction. But I, no one, I don't think anyone, Tim included, <laughs> had any idea that they were going to resonate, let alone that Dr. Vicks is going to be putting up so much volume over here as a result. So those micros are clearly a place where a lot of you like to play these days. The options are coming soon, so hopefully we'll have more to discuss on that front in the near future. We've got to keep on rolling. Mr. Once in Future, Dr. Vic, sir, where should we hang our hat next on our journey through the world of futures options? Oh, let's go to metals. I'm keeping you off balance because you always think I want to go somewhere and I'm not going there this week. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not in our movers and shakers. You can't. You're legally <laughs> obligated to not say it this week, which is kind of fun. It's a rare week where the euro dollar is not there in the top five. So which metal do you want to go to? Where should we hang our hat? Uh, let's go to the really shiny, bright, whitish one, not the gold. Shiny, bright, whitish one that is not the gold. So clearly platinum. <laughs> so that one, of course, doing what I say, about 40 contracts so, so far this week. We're going to hang our hats instead, li- listeners, in silver. It's kind of hard to ignore out there of late. After being the forgotten brother of silver for so long, <laughs> all of a sudden, it, or excuse me, forgotten silver brother of gold for so long. And gold's been doing well as well, obviously, hitting a record high of near 2,100 out there after breaking through the 1,900 level. Uh, so gold doing well too, but silver just is in a, a league of its own, to quote from a uh, early 90s film, I believe, out there. Let's see. Silver coming into today's show this week so far up 18.5% so far since Monday. Puts it at about 28.70. I mean, that's just these – are, these are insane levels. Up <laughs> – talking up another – oh, nearly about four and a half handles or so just this week alone. So silver – Clearly feeling the love out there. The bulls out there are happy, I should say, quite a bit. Let's look at what's going on from an overall action perspective. Most of that action, about 44.6%, was in the September contract out here. So interesting stuff, about half the paper going up out there. That SEP contract, the vol is a, let's see, it looks like oh, 70 and a quarter right now. It's up 19 points. So that's blowing the doors off Bitcoin vol right now. Bitcoin vol is around a 66. So silver, more volatile than Bitcoin out there right now. Put that in your pipe and smoke it out there, all you, all you crypto heads out there who are amazed and aghast that silver could even approach the volatility of, of your beloved Bitcoin. So that's a big move out here this week. Let's see if the skew is reflecting that. Yeah, it is. The puts last week were 4.3% cheap to the add the money. This week, they're 6.8% rich. So normally... You're going to see if all things being equal. If you move up that skew curve, you should see those puts get a little bit of firmness to them. This is a lot of firmness, so that's uh, interesting. And the calls, ironically, are unched. 
So we've exploded up <laughs> the skew, and yet the calls are unch. That's kind of interesting in and of itself because usually in the quiet time, you expect those calls to come in. If you explode upward like we did, you expect those calls to maybe get a little bit of a lift. This, they kind of stayed exactly unch. So they probably got a bid and probably came back in a little bit as a result. So it's still 8.8% rich. So no change in the calls puts extremely bid. That's kind of interesting, and maybe that tells you a, a little bit of what the market is looking at out there as well. Let's see what the hot contracts were out here this week. If you said the 27 handle calls, then you are the winner, winner, chicken. Actually, no, I take that back. 27 handle calls were the winner in September, but if you've got to go a little bit farther out, all the way to Dece, and it's the 30 calls. Yes, the three zero calls, lighting it up to the tune of about 2,700. Remember, this is silver. It doesn't do – it did 63,000 contracts. That's pretty decent. But not like it's not like euro dollars or anything out there. So, but talking about twenty seven hundred contracts, the big print actually today on these thirty calls, eighteen hundred of those, worth noting about twelve hundred of the thirty fives also went up today. So maybe there's a bit of a weird ratio going up out there, thirty thirty five in Dees. Either way, both of those strikes pretty active. Back to September, which did almost half the paper out here this week. That was where the twenty sevens were very active. The now in the money twenty seven calls. The lion's share actually today again, 1,026 today, total of about 2,100, so about half that paper coming today. The rest of the week slightly opening, and we'll see what today's numbers lead us to. So interesting action out here on silver, pretty much all on the upside, all on the calls, even though these puts are getting firm. Let's just look really quickly and see what happened on the put front that maybe could give us some indication. It was the 22 puts going up 1,200 times in September, and the 25 puts going up about 1,100 times. So... Clearly, paper must be liking those because <laughs> that put wing getting extremely juicy. Mr. Rose, you spend any time analyzing the, the vol of all things shiny over there these days, sir? I always take a, you know, I always taking a look at the skew and, and trying to get an idea as to what direction the option traders are leaning or where they're paying up for options. Um, so, you know, for right now, it looks like we might be expecting more upside, or at least that's what they're braced for. Yeah, I'm looking here, and uh, even the folks at FTSE coming out with some gold. See, it's not all small caps over there in FTSE land, listeners. They have some analysis here from their FTSE Russell blog uh, showing gold blowing past. This is gold now, blowing past this 200-day moving average, nearly 2,000 a troy ounce. First time uh, breaking the previous high that was set in September of 2011. So let's, let's really quickly start talking silver and FTSE folks here talking about gold. Let's shift over to gold really quickly, too, and see if we see something analogous. Gold skew is always... An interesting beast. It has kind of a life and a mind of its own, and it tends to move in very dramatic fashion, unlike some of the equities and other things where the, the, the skew is a relatively staid beast. It may change in slope, but it doesn't really change markedly beyond that. Gold, however, a different beast. Coming into today's show, we're seeing gold at 2,061. So, again, well past those record highs of 19, was it 1936 last week? We're over. Over well beyond that at this point, about a thousand points beyond that and chain, thousand thirty or so out here. So gold feeling the love. Doesn't seem like that long ago. We were talking about can it maintain north of sixteen hundred? Well, spoiler alert, it can. And them then some, of course. Obviously, a lot of interesting discussion about the dollar, what's going on, the equities and treasuries, all these things combining inflation fears combining to drive a lot of love in gold. Right now here, the gold with the most was also in September, the most love. About 34% in that September contract has about 20 days to go out there as well. The vol up there pretty strong, up about four and a quarter points to about 24 and a quarter. So it was about 20 last week, about 24 and a quarter this week. So gold vol has been an interesting beast of late, and we've talked about it a lot here on the show. It never really could maintain the upside. We'll see if it could contain it now as it's been on the rampage for the better part of the last few weeks. You can certainly, hard to argue, it's not meriting this level of volatility. So silver at about a 70 plus vol, Bitcoin in the mid 60s or so, and gold at about a 24. Interesting. What's going on out there in terms of skew? Let's see. The calls last week were 7.1% rich. This week they're a little bit cheaper 6.4% rich, and the puts 3.1% cheap. And this week they are 2.9% cheap. So the puts are still cheap, still fading the puts about the exact same level, and the calls have come in a little bit. So Interesting stuff. Maybe the fact that we retreated off some of those uh, recent highs, maybe causing folks to not have as much love. Let's see what the big prints were out here this week. It was in September, and pretty much across the board, it was the 20 half calls that were the big dog this week. They went up 13,079 times the lion's share yesterday, about 5,600 going up yesterday, about 2,000 today, 3,300 
on Tuesday, 2100 on Monday. A good chunk of that opening this week. So opening 20 halves makes sense. We blew through that strike now. So those are now in the money calls. Let's see. Hot on the heels of that were the 2000s. I, th- I kind of thought that would be the big dog because folks in, in the medals like their very round numbers out here. But the, the 2000 strike only doing about 11,000 contracts this week. The lion's share coming on Tuesday, 5,300. And most of that is closing. So some folks apparently blow through the 2000 strike. They're getting the heck out of Dodge. <laughs> Maybe rolling up to the 20 halves or going somewhere else. But they, they closed out their 2000s out there. Then we kind of fall off quite a bit. Let's see. The next biggest contract out here is actually out here in October. It's the 2125 calls going up about almost 6,000 times out here this week. Interesting stuff out here. Mr. Rhodes, I know silver is kind of getting up there these days, but how is gold faring in your research and analysis these days? Is this a hot one for you, sir? Um, it's most definitely the hot one right now. It's the one that everybody's asking about. You, you even noted that uh, the folks at FTSE Russell are writing about it, so it's still getting a lot of attention. Uh, I'm trying to get a read. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling at trying to get a read on um, the skew right now, and it uh, may be starting to peter out a little bit if you look at it day over day. Um, you know, maybe everybody, maybe there's some folks that felt we were going to run to the 2000 and then were we going to pull one of those head fakes around the round numbers that some of the markets like to do as opposed to barreling through and continuing onward. But we'll, uh, we'll see. All right, let's keep this train rolling. Let's go a little bit of dark side here. Let's get a little weird. Let's get a little wild just cause you don't have a chance to talk about this one, but it moves a lot. And it's doing decent paper this week. It's closing out 10,000 contracts, and it's our number one mover to the dark side. You folks who like all the ag juice out there are going to get a little ag love. But on the dairy side, <laughs> going to go to our old friend Class 3 Milk. You know, we've been joking about it for a long time, since the beginning of the year here on this show, that what's up with dairy? Dairy's getting a lot of interest. Certainly the vol is increasing out there. But it was kind of a bit of a, bit of a joke topic for us. But no longer. This thing is, is starting to merit the interest and certainly the paper out here. This is uh, pretty strong out here. Last week it did 7,600 7, contracts, so it's closing in on up 25% already volume wise here this week. Coming into, let's see, showtime right now. That front future it was off 20% on since last show. It's off about five, almost 6% since the beginning of the week. So obviously a lot of this milk move happened on the tail end of last week. The hot contract out here with nearly 44% of the paper was let's see it was that front august contract doing about 44 percent of the paper the vol out here this has got 25 days to go still so got a little bit of time left we can analyze the skew pretty safely out here the vol is 14 and a half the vol is actually in uh, in about two and three quarters percent so maybe that shows how frothy that front month vol uh got out here the skew the puts were 8.2 percent rich last week this week 5.2 percent so the puts Actually, I'll take that back. The puts were 8.2% rich last week. This week, they're 5.2% cheap. So the puts got annihilated this week. Listeners, the calls, 6.6% cheap last week. This week, they're showing an even, 0.0. Maybe there's just not enough data here to come up with a number. That seems odd that they're exactly unched. They could be literally unched from the at the money. It would be rare, though. Let's go see the big print out here this week. Again, we're talking not huge numbers, but 19 even puts with about almost 500 on the tape. Almost exactly half of that, 256 coming on Tuesday, slightly opening. So 19 even puts as we're barreling down towards the 19 strike. Makes a certain amount of sense out here. Let's see if any other weird prints are dominating our tape out here this week. You go farther out, it's all 17 calls for some strange reason, September of next year. Uh, let's see, the other big print was the 20 half calls which are obviously out of the money calls now, doing about 400 and change. The lion's share yesterday, a buck 23, and slightly closing on that. So closing upside and maybe some opening downside. Actually, they're probably annihilating those puts. So opening selling puts because someone annihilated that put skew pretty aggressively here this week. Interesting stuff afoot here. Mr. Rhodes, does dairy, dare I say it, dairy ever make it on your list of analysis out here, sir? The only time I even think about it is when I'm on this show. <laughs> No, that would How's be that? that would be a resounding. I know it's not note. helping you much at all. But that's, that's about it. <laughs> all right, all right. Tell you what, Sean. Since he's of no use to me at all right now, I'm going to let you choose 
where we hang our hats last before we go to the listeners. There's been a whole bevy of products we've discussed here on the show so far, a lot on our Movers and Shakers. Maybe you want to go beyond the Movers and Shakers or something else. What product is tickling your fancy here to close out the show this week, Sean? I think I mentioned early in the show the, the, the weakness of the U.S. dollar. So how about some foreign exchange? A little bit of FX. Okay, let's see. Do you have a, do you have a particular, you want to go just pound dollar? or What floats your boat out there, sir? Got to go pound dollar. <laughs> okay, pound let's go. dollar. We, you know, pound euro dollar. Yeah, funny. <laughs> pound uh, euro. Yeah, okay. pound dollar. Let's do all things pound euro. Let's really go deep into, uh, into that one. Let's, go, let's get a little FX on the show. Why not? You guys like yourself a little bit of FX. Let's go out here to the pound dollar out here this week. See how things are moving. Again, the dollar is driving a lot of things. FX, not the least of which. Not enough to make it onto our movers and shakers this week, though. Pound dollar up about a third of a percent to the upside listeners. So you know Bitcoin, others not making the top five. Pound dollar not going to make it out here this week. Still decent paper, about 24,000 contracts on the tapes. You're talking about 2.5x what we're seeing out there in fluid milk. So active week out here. That compares to about, oh, 10,000. It was like last week, so... Pretty, uh, pretty active, active week out here for all things pound dollar. Let's see where the lion's share of the paper was this week. It was out in this SEP contract to the tune of, that has about 28, almost 29 days to go. That's where 52.8% of the paper went up. If you're wondering, listeners, that pound dollar is at about a 1.31 and a half out there. Right now, the vol is up ever so slightly. FX vols kind of been a bit of a weird beast. It's up 0. 0.06, so it's effectively unched at around a nine. So we're talking about all these other products that have, you know, 20 to 70 vol out there. This is the nine vol out here. So FX vol is a little bit of a different beast out here. Skew wise, listeners out here in September, the puts were one and a half percent rich last week. This week, 2.2 percent rich. And we've got the calls were about 1% rich last week, and now they are a third of a percent cheap. So a little bit of skew action out here. Let's see where the big print was. It was, we're at about 1.31 and a half listeners. We're at 1.38 even to the upside was the big print in September, doing about 3,200 contracts. All of that today. Only three went up on Monday. Pretty much all of that was today. And it looks like the 1.34s also did about 2,300 about 2,200 of that coming today as well. So today, a big day for pound dollar out here. A lot of action here to the upside. 1.35 calls, also doing about 13, almost 1,400 of that. It's hard to tell pretty much any of this open interest changes because it all went up today pretty much. So today was where the action was out here in pound dollar. Let's look really quickly to see any other weird prints that were afoot in this contract that's going out today. The 1.31 calls, so in the money calls now are going up about a, almost 1,100 times today. So that one's been pretty active throughout the week. That's one of the few contracts we're seeing here that was that was active throughout the week. It was uh, today is where all the action is out here in pound dollar. Interesting stuff. Mr. Rhodes, how often does FX come across your research? I mean, it's not a huge vol story all the time, so that might limit it, its utility for you. But uh, how often does FX come across your radar? And if so, any thoughts here on the old pound dollar, sir? No, nah, it's it's something I don't ter- don't look at nearly as much as as I look at other areas, and it's really just because of the, you know, the such low volatility that's priced in in the currency market, and how we just don't really seem to get the action that we want to. Now there might be something on the horizon, but I would be looking more as far as dollar weakness because, you know, in supply and demand, when there's more and more of something relative to something else, whatever there's more of becomes worth less. And it seems like there's just more and more dollars being put out there. So there, there could be something on the horizon, uh, but I haven't really, you know, looked at what's being priced in and and where the opportunities might be right now. But I would always look. I, I like to look at euro versus dollar or yen versus dollar. The 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 pound's got its own issues, so I, I'm afraid there would be something idiosyncratic that would sneak up on me with respect to to what's going on between them and Europe. Pound does always have its own issues. You know who doesn't have issues, though? It's our listeners. You guys are just full of interesting comments and suggestions and questions. So without further ado, let's get to some of you guys and some of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options. 
Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, StockTwits.com slash Options Insider, or via questions at the TheOptionsInsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, we'll see what you guys have in store for us this week. First up, TML6, exclamation point. So he's excited. <laughs> he or she wants to know, are there any commodity ETFs out there that you feel do a good job of tracking their underlying and don't suffer from negative roll yield? Thanks for reading and love the show. Just trying to get some color since my broker is slow to adopt futures. Well, you should probably switch brokers there, TML6, exclamation point. You know, this question comes in a lot, and not, I'm, not, I'm going to say these ones not just because they're top of mind for a lot of people right now because the metals are moving, but I always point people in the GLD, SLB area, A, because people like the metals they can usually understand and wrap their heads around. They're a little bit less obtuse than something like a nat gas or a euro dollar or something else requires a little bit more, perhaps, study and understanding of what's going on. People are at least tangentially aware of what's happening usually in the metals, particularly gold. And also, I mean, they have their problems like any other ETF does, but at least they hold the physical. So that one question you're worried about, that negative roll yield, doesn't really come into play with the GLD and the SLB because they're not trying to recreate a futures position using a basket of something else. They are actually hold the physical commodity. So that at least insulates you from that part, which I like. And they do a fairly decent job of tracking the underlying as well, which is always, of course, importance in any sort of ETF that you're trading out there. So these days I tend to lean towards those. Mr. Rhodes, what are your thoughts here for TML6 exclamation point? Any any commodity ETFs out there that you like that don't have the roll yield issues? Uh, you pretty much nailed them. And I, I went searching while you were talking to see if there was anything uh, with any of the other metals that, that we hadn't talked about. Really, GLD and SLV, uh, those two do a very, very good job of, try- as you mentioned, they basically hold the spot, so they track the spot price. And in fact, you know, in certain cases, they may be better than, um, and I shouldn't say this, but they may be better than looking at futures um, as far as the one-for-one relationship. Of course, you get a much better use of capital when you're trading futures and options on futures than either of those ETFs. But I totally agree with how you started out, which is if your broker is not adopting futures, there are plenty of uh, relatively low-priced and well-tooled brokerage firms that will allow you to flip right back and forth between trading futures and securities in the same account. So without naming anybody or poo-pooing who you're using right now, Uh, you really might want to give some consideration to looking around or tell your broker you're going to look around and maybe that'll speed them up to adopting futures. Yeah, that'll give them that little kick in the pants. I like both of these. If you were expecting a one-to-one, you know, relationship to the underlying, you may be a little bit uh, taken aback by that. I'm looking at SLV right now. It's at 26.61 and that front future is at a 28.66 out there. So there's about a two-point discrepancy between, right now at least, between SLV and uh, what we're seeing out there in the silver Futures, but again, there's some other reasons inherent to what's causing that, but something to bear in mind. It does move pretty decently with it, but not exact one to one pricing out there. But roll yield, yeah, you're pretty safe in GLD and SLV. Yeah, you're right, Russell. There's a management fee out there, so it's probably some of that eating away <laughs> at some of that, uh, that, that premium there. All right, let's go to Maddie Ice 42069. <laughs> We were talking about, speaking of the dollar, we were talking about the dollar earlier and how the, uh, it's set for the sixth weekly slump and uh, experts have seen limited rebound opportunity out there, something we were talking about earlier on the network. And Matty Ice chiming in, wait, <laughs> does flooding the marketplace with almost unlimited dollars devalue, in all caps, the currency? <laughs> does Jay Powell, obviously talking about Mr. Powell over there, does Jay Powell know this? <laughs> you know, Sean, this has obviously been a big talking point for a while there, this just... Just flooding our marketplace with almost endless stimulus dollars. We're kind of at an unprecedented point for that in terms of we've never really seen like this much stimulus uh, this quickly out here. So some folks uh, 
Sounds like Maddie Ice as well. A little bit concerned that this may uh, devalue <laughs> some of our currency. I know you guys have been looking at this at FTSE Russell. What are your thoughts here, Sean, on this this almost endless stimulus maybe contributing to what we're seeing this this slide in the dollar, sir? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely causing the slide in the dollar, but it's also causing the strength in the equity complexes uh, on on the other side of that trade, which is why we're seeing the performance we're seeing. Um, you know, we went through this in 08 um, with all types of economic stimulus as well, um, and then through the through that crisis, and uh, you know, we we weathered that storm slowly and, and gradually got to absolutely new highs. Uh, post that crisis, right? So um, it seems that uh, our, our Federal Reserve knows what they're doing. Um, I'm probably I'm not the best economist in the world to be uh, speaking in terms of dollar strength or or where it's going to take us next. But uh, um, it's just really interesting to see, and you can see it in in volumes. You mentioned kind of uh, kind of a, uh, an average nine volatility in currency, so uh, not too much of a of a, of a fear factor there. VIX uh, remains strong, as does the RVX. That, that spread has widened quite a bit today. So, you know, there's, there's all these components, and it seems to all get correlated to government intervention and uh, more of this uh, economic uh, strife that we're going through. So it's really interesting times. And I don't know, Russell, if you had something you wanted to add there. <laughs> um, no, not really. I just I do want to do want to agree with Matty Ice's um, platform there, which is uh, if people don't know what four twenty sixty nine stands for, it's uh, you only want to have a four day work week. You only want to work 20 hours a week and you want to make sixty nine dollars an hour. And that is my platform and is running for president. But that's actually if you see that number, <laughs> that's what that's what it means among the kids. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Thank you for educating <laughs> our youth uh, consultant here, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, I probably could have guessed some other things for that, but interesting interesting nonetheless. Uh, all right. Next up, Chugs. He's got one for you, Sean. He says, can the <laughs> – that's like – can the Russell guy, I guess you're the Russell guy, unless he means Russell Rhodes, in which he's also a Russell guy. Can the Russell guy explain why it would be good to invest in Russell 2000 right now? Well, I don't know if you can give straight up investment advice, Sean. It probably goes against your, your credo over there. But what are your thoughts for Chugs? He's obviously interested. Maybe some interesting factoids or, or nuggets of info you may have about Russell 2000 versus other indices out there that might interest him, Sean. I'll say, I'll say a couple of things and then I'll leave it to the Russell, Russell guy. <laughs> you, you just you got to know you have to stick to your strategy and you got to stick to your trading disciplines. That being know your points of entry and know your points of exit um, and stick to those those strategies of entrance and when you want to get out of a, a trade. That would be my guidance to, uh, uh, to your questioner. Since we have the other Russell guy with us as well, quite literally, other Russell guy, what do you have to say here for uh, for Chugs who wants some info on all things Russell 2000, sir? Well, you know, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I, I do think that, and of course, as I'm saying this, it's not playing out today, but um, I do think that we're overdue for uh, the large cap stocks and to to give up some of their outperformance relative to small caps. And if you were bullish on the overall equity market, just in general, I think maybe you want to look to small caps for some better valuations than large caps because of that performance difference. Uh, if you're looking at an index fund, uh, valuation-wise, the Russell 2000 is a – yeah, and nothing's a really good value with how much the stock markets run up. But on a relative basis, I would say if you're going to compare the Russell 2000, the NASDAQ 100, or the S&P 500, the three things that you've got um, – you know, basically really good ways to get exposure to uh, that the Russell 2000 would probably be my favorite right now. Yeah, you mentioned that outperformance, large caps to small caps. We've been talking about that in some of our other shows as well, including the option block. And I was just mentioning on the show earlier today, actually, we've seen a lot of, obviously all the headlines are on the rally and it's driven by these fang names lifting all boats with them. But we look at a lot of the smaller names in our odd block segment there and it seems like a lot of them peaked on the same day on june 8th and then they, then they all have kind of had the bottom fall out kind of ever since have been trending back down the other side so while the big names have been lifting and rallying and getting all the headlines june 8th seemed like it was a pretty top heavy day for a lot of these smaller names out there and a lot of them haven't really recovered those levels so interesting 
line of demarcation, perhaps, there to investigate as you're analyzing small caps versus large caps out there, listeners. All right, let's see. Let's we got a bunch here. Let's let's jump to this one, Mr. Rhodes. This is kind of up your alley. We'll end on a on a vol note. This comes from Martini. Martini wants to know. Where do you see the most interesting opportunities for vol traders right now? Maybe we need a weekly volatility report across all of the different assets so you can break down the major vol changes in all of the leading products. You know, we try to touch on that on the show here this week, every week, really, Martini. Obviously, it's impossible to do all of the products (laughs) trading on CME. We'd be here for quite some time. But uh, we try to break down the major ones and the big moves and the vol changes therein. Uh, but maybe we could do a a vol report somewhere baked in there as well across some of the leading ones. We'll have to figure out. We get this question a lot, and it's a, again, it's a subjective thing. Uh, how do you really measure that? Which future? How do you look at it? The percent change? All these different things. But it's an interesting idea. That said, Mr. Rhodes uh, Martini wants to know, where do you see the most interesting opportunities for vol traders right now, I know you like to hang your hat in equity vol, but energy vol has been interesting of late. Or maybe you got somewhere else you're looking right now, Mr. Rowe. What's piquing your fancy? Uh, I, you know, I actually think taking the other side of how high gold vol has gotten might not be the worst idea in the world. Um, as I mentioned before, we got over a significant level. I wouldn't be surprised if it takes a break from there. And one of the neat things about metal volatility, and I've said this a hundred times on this show, even though I haven't been on here that, that much, but, um, you know, y- you get higher skew on the call side. So throwing a little bit of direction into that, you know, it might be. You know, selling some calls, selling some out of the money calls or doing something with out of the money calls to take advantage of higher implied volatility relative to gold might not be the worst idea in the world. Same thing with silver. Um, I know I'm throwing a directional play into that, uh, but in the equity space, I think you should be looking at the uh, the options on the Russell futures, uh, because I I don't think the um, the uh, elevated RVX, as we talked about earlier, I don't think it's justified going forward. I really don't. Um, I just don't see uh, further massive underperform- further underperformance of small caps relative to large caps. So if something starts happening that's bad for the stock market, I think it's going to hit some of the other indexes more than it'll hit the Russell 2000. Um, and of course, if if we all start going in a nice uptrend, I think the Russell 2000 will outperformed to the upside. And I think that would put more pressure on Russell 2000 volatility than the other uh, broad-based index volatility. Well said, sir. That music means we'll have to leave it there for this week in futures options. Listeners, before we go, let's go back around the horn. Mr. Rhodes, if folks are intrigued, maybe they have questions about vol trading or analyzing some specific underlying. Maybe they want to check out one of your books. Uh, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Uh, books on Amazon. Don't buy the VIX book that's up there. A new one's coming out in a couple of in a couple of months at the latest. Uh, when I write things about the markets, uh, we we put them in front of the paywall at EQ Derivatives. And in fact, the question you got about the major vol changes in all leading products, I'm thinking about starting to do a weekly thing that talks about vol changes, but it's not just U.S. markets. It's, um, you know, the, the global markets as well. So I'm given some consideration. I used to do something like that with just SIBO stuff. But um, I also am, I'm thinking about doing that for a, a Globally, because people around the world are paying more attention to volatility. Global Vol, that's the place to go. Give him a follow on the old Twitters. That's the easiest place to find him. Russell Rhodes, one U, two S's, two L's, and then Rhodes is R H O A D S. You can find him over there on the Twitters, tweeting out interesting things in between episodes of our program. Mr. Sean, unfortunately, we lost him there at the end there. He had to run off, do some other fun stuff. You know where to find all his good stuff. FTSERussell.com, F T S C Russell.com. For all that data, I didn't have a chance to get to all of it here on the show. They have interesting research on gold versus the dollar right now, the gold and the risk appetite, small caps versus large caps. You know where to find all this good stuff. Footsierussell.com is a home for a lot more research than just small caps, even though it's a lot of it up there as well. But there's a lot of stuff going on there. Give them a follow on the old Twitters as well, at Footsie Russell is the place to go. And, of course, you know where to go to find all these reports we're talking about, maybe some great research from Eric and Blue and the rest of the crew at CME Group com slash twifo slash twio to begin your journey there. Check out the reports and 
on over to the main pages for the research and all that good stuff. And on behalf of Sean and the other Russell guy <laughs> and our friends over there at CME and indeed myself, I thank all of you out there for downloading, for streaming, for subscribing, for sending in such great questions. Keep them coming for listening live, all that good stuff. Remember, if you like what you hear, keep those reviews coming to keep new folks discovering the show all the time. And we'll see you back here tomorrow, 1 p.m. Central, for Volatility Views. And it kicks off again on Monday with the Option Block all the way through to Thursday for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.